New York Times best-selling author, John Gilstrap. See how well I did that? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. You did. got it right. Finally got it right. Uh, and our first guest um, in this half hour, or f- full hour if we can, is Senator Jason Barrett. Welcome, Jay. Good morning. You know, I can only imagine the thrill that Rob got when he recorded your intro. He, uh, uh, he had fun. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah. <laughs> One of those things you do because you get paid to do it. (laughs) So how is Summer? How's the uh, pregnancy going? Uh, She is doing really well. She's uh, been a a champion through the the whole process. So um, there was, I don't want to say a scare, but there was some concern several weeks ago that that she was going to go into active labor too soon. And so she had to take it easy for a while, and um, she quickly got over taking it easy for a while. So uh, it's going well. Um, We expect to... Have a newborn baby in a few days. And you revealed to us um, off air the, the baby name. So, Summer, if you could just post on the Facebook feed how to spell it, that'd be great. Yeah. I don't think that she's going to fall for that one. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a competition uh, to see how, if anybody can guess the name. Yeah, you can do that. There have been several people that, that attempted and they, you know, get out the, uh, get out Google and go through every West Virginia county to see if they can pick out the name or not so but yeah I, I think that's a great idea I think Mongolia is a wonderful name Canal Barrett yeah. yeah or Boone Barrett that'd be kind of fun too yeah I don't know that it'd be fun for the child yeah. that much but <laughs> I don't think the little girl wants to walk around being called Boo <laughs> never know well, so, you know, there was a Virginia, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not but there was a Virginia Senator Hogg who named his daughters Ima and Yura wow, wow. back in the day Makes that wasn't I, that wasn't recent. I hope. No, 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 no. This goes like I said. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but that it's. I've grown up thinking that's a true story. Well, I hope not. I hope <laughs> not too. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we just got through a special session. Obviously, with summer being so close to uh, having the baby, you, you you did not attend, but I'm sure you followed. Any I, thoughts? I, I did, and um, you know, I think that. You, I was thinking about it the other day, that missing special session. I, I think in my 10 years of service in the legislature that you can probably count on one hand how many days that I've missed of special session. And I don't think I've ever missed a day, maybe one of regular session in 10 years. So, I, you know, it's important, you know, as you know, Mike, when uh, voters put their trust in you to, to do a job that you show up and do it. And uh, so, you know, it's it's tough for me to miss but but obviously the family has to come first and no i definitely think so yeah and you know with the maybe one exception of a little bit of fireworks down over one particular issue um you know we knew everything was going to go through fairly smoothly um i did join the caucus call uh the senate republicans had a caucus call uh prior to um special session where you know we were able to ask questions and go over uh, explanations of all the bills so um, you know as you know special session uh, recently here in the past couple of years is has all gone very smoothly most things are kind of worked out uh, prior to to going to uh, uh, to uh, into special session um, and one of the things I, th- I think is important that, that maybe we don't stress as much but um, it does cost $35,000 a day to have a special session outside of interims but uh, the legislative leadership on both the House and the Senate uh, working with the governor's office uh, have really been able to do those simultaneously to have uh, interims and have special when sessions we were there already, so it wasn't yeah, yeah, we're already there yeah. there's there's no additional cost everyone is is in town so you know the the per diem rates is already get, are already getting paid the, the travel reimbursement so that's important you know thirty five thousand dollars in the grand scheme of a five billion dollar budget isn't much money but it's still taxpayer money and w- when you can be efficient with that you should so it seems to me that the senate is a little more unified than the house uh with on your caucus call was everybody pretty much on the same page um, yeah i think with so the bills that, the, yeah they're, the they're that yeah, and I'm sorry I cut you off a little bit there, yeah. but uh, yeah, and that's that's typical uh, of the kind of the way we operate. But uh, in, in the House's defense, and you know, I served yep. several years there. Uh, it's it's a little easier when you're dealing with 30 as opposed to 89 yeah. or whatever you guys 88 or 89. I, don't, I forget at this point, but uh, it's a little different. Um, so um, there are. I, I don't know that. And I'm trying to say this delicately, but I don't know that we have the challenging personalities necessarily in the Senate caucus that, that the House has. Now, obviously, there's going to be some change in, in leadership. And there's, as you said, only 30, which brings up how much jockeying or how much negotiating will be going on from now until the end of the 
the year to decide who the new leadership is and what roles people will play. Yeah, and it's an interesting time. Any type there is a leadership race, whether in the House it's for the Speaker or for the, the Senate, it's the President. Um, and as you, you know, Mike, that, that when there's clearly going to be a change at the top, and there is in the mm -hmm. State Senate with uh, uh, President Blair losing his primary, that, that we're going to have a new president. And as you can imagine, that there have been phone calls made and uh, there are people that have expressed interest. Um, you know, I look at this um, as something that we don't have to decide overnight. And we, yeah. we have plenty of time. Uh, the, the session uh, really starts uh, with when, when we elect a governor. Uh, there is a one day session in January, the second Wednesday. And, and then we uh, recess until February and come back. So you know, we have to have this in place, um, you know, in December, I think. And, and we'll probably have it figured out prior to that. Um, but as I look at it, um, you know, I think that it, at least on social issues, we have pro our caucus has probably gone uh, a little uh, more conservative, a little more to the right. And I think uh, as I look at it, that our leadership team is probably should and and probably will uh, become a little more conservative mm -hmm. and so we'll, we'll work through that um and, and i'm optimistic that we can have a consensus candidate that that all members of our caucus and i, I don't know how many we're going to have there are a couple of races that that could be competitive in the general election and we, we could have 32 or 33 members of, of uh, the senate be in right. the republican caucus and is there a pecking order is there the certain way to get to the senate presidency or is it pretty much it's a consensus any anybody yeah, can it's who who can put the votes together right and and again i've, I've had a couple of conversations i haven't had any conversations i think it's too early I'm, i'll be honest I, I haven't had any conversations that, that we're way into the weeds and really getting into what the makeup of the leadership team would look like. And I think one of the things that's important to me is to, you know, I need to have a conversation with my co-senator uh, before I'm, I'm willing to, to really step out and do anything. And I uh, am optimistic and, and really hopeful that she and I will be uh, on the same page moving forward and, and helping put this leadership team together. So in terms of policy, with uh, a new governor coming in and with Craig Blair gone, are there was a certain momentum that's been built over the last few years. So are all of those priorities essentially reset now and there's no momentum going anymore? No, I don't think so. And I, I think that you're probably talking a lot about the economic development and those type of projects. Right. I mean, uh, everybody kind of knew what was being targeted yeah. and what our destinations were. Yeah. and I, But I think that that has been, the, the targets have been, the destination has been set by the Republican caucus in the Senate. I don't think it was be, being set by one individual. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks. Um, I mean, Craig has said that on multiple yeah. times. It, it's a group effort on the Senate. Is that, yeah, is, it, it really is. It, it really is. And, um, you know, I think that that, that will continue. And, and maybe even more so. And so um, I think from what you'll see out of uh, Governor Morrissey, I think will be extremely uh, beneficial to the Eastern Panhandle as we talk about some things. And an IDD waiver was a big topic in this session. And uh, I think the House wanted to put in some of the uh, rates set directly into code. And one of the things that I think we should do is allow the agency to have different rates for different areas of the state. Um, kind of a locality or regional um, a market rate as opposed to a flat across the board. And I think when you have a governor from the Eastern Panhandle, which, you know, I, I think we should. I know there's been talk of Republicans trying to support Joe Manchin. And I think that's silly. I think that's being orchestrated by Manchin supporters, not not necessarily Republicans. But I think it's incredibly important that that, that we support and, and elect Governor or Patrick Morrissey, a governor in, in November, so that these Eastern Panhandle specific issues can be addressed, um, whether it's locality pay. And I, and I think you do that through the agency. We, we've, we've tried it uh, multiple times in the legislature. A couple of year ago, years ago, I advocated and passed out of the Senate, failed in the House the last couple of days to allow state agencies uh, to go in and um, have a policy that allows them to do some type of lo locality pay. Give, it, it really mandated that they come up with a plan. They would come back to the legislature. Um, you know, yeah, you ordered implement. a study, correct? Well, it really wasn't a study. It, it, it was a mandate to the agency to come up with a plan. Right. They weren't going to implement the plan. The legislature would have to come back, and, and we would have to um, appropriate money for them to be able to, to give 
some market rate pay into Eastern Panhandle and other areas of growth and and, and where there um, are higher uh, wages. And so I, I think that with a governor from the Eastern Panhandle, you're now able to let that governor and his administration tell these agencies, hey, look, this is a priority. This is what we're going to do. And, and I would certainly... Um, you know, assist and, and advocate to the governor's office that, that we really make that a priority. I want to double back on this thing about the Republicans, rich Republicans allegedly getting behind Mansion. Whether it's true or not, whether it can happen or not, try to get in into the heads of those who would do such a thing and explain the logic to me because it makes no sense to me. Normally, I'm pretty good about thinking, okay, I think it's a bad idea, but I get where they're coming from. I can't get to where they're coming from. Does it make any sense at all? Of why you think they're doing it? Or yeah, why, why, why? Would re, why would Republicans want to back Manchin, I a think Democrat, that's just a rumor, instead John. of... Well, I mean, got a lot of, I mean, got a, a lot did, of headlines. Yeah, I just don't see Steve stepping down either. I don't, I, I don't know if any Republicans that have told me that, hey, we really want Joe Manchin to run for this or that. I mean, it was clear that he couldn't win that United States Senate race uh, as a Democrat, and, and that's why he didn't run again. Um, I, I, I don't believe that he can beat Patrick Morrissey head-to-head um, in, a, um, in a governor's race either. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the angle is. Um, and then if he were to run as a, as a third party or uh, unaffiliated, um, I mean, what message does that then say to the, right. the West Virginia Democrat Party? I mean, it's, it's on life support as it is. And then um, and that were to happen, I, I just don't I don't see a path where anybody other than Patrick Morrissey is our next governor. So uh, Patrick Morrissey is not governor yet. Sure. He, he has to be elected. If he's going to be governor, that has to happen in November. So are there legal constraints between now and November on what planning can be done between the legislature, which is also not yet elected, uh, the, the planning that can be done before Election Day so that on Inauguration Day, when or whenever it is you meet, I guess it's February for the, for the next session, you'll you be up and running and and the the decks are cleared to get good things done, or do you have to wait until after the election and people are officially in office again to to actually? Oh yeah, you, you, yeah. The, the process is you have to wait until the election day is over. Once election day is over, the the governor elect at that point would. I, and I think probably because we all know the way that this election should go. Um, and, and maybe they both would do it, even if Steve Williams thinks he has a shot at winning this, that you kind of start to want to put the puzzle together, you know, because there are a lot of positions, a lot of uh, secretary positions that you have to fill. Um, some and of them, in your opinion um, and in, in your experience, pretty much all of those positions are, are filled with new people, right? It, it depends. That, and that's that's kind of what I was getting at. I, I would expect maybe some of them to stay. Some of them may decide that it's time to retire. Maybe some of them go to to Washington with um, then Senator Justice. So uh, that will be up to the, the new governor and his team to, to put together. But I, I would expect and I, I would imagine that, that uh, the two candidates running for governor are probably thinking about how to put the team together. Uh, because it is. I mean, you get through um, November election, and, and you really have to be ready to go in January. That's when the new governor is sworn in. So there's not a lot of time to put this together at that point. So there should be a lot of planning uh, ahead of that to you know to be able to hit the ground running. And I expect that to be going on. And legislative deal making ahead of time. What what type of deal making? Um, the but what I really need from you is this, so will oh. you give me that? That the, the sort of thing that would happen during a session. Yeah, the transactional nature. The transactional of, stuff, yes. And, 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 I, be, and I'll tell you, offline? I hate the transactional nature of the session <laughs> at the last few days. And um, that's, but that's what it becomes. And it's unfortunate. I try to avoid it, but, you know... You can't you can't completely avoid it, but I, I try not to do it. And, and I think uh, that's why the uh, the session starts late. Give the governor a little more time, yeah. and then he sets the agenda with his state of the state address, and we kind of go from there. He'll set the tone for the year. Yeah, but the transaction back to the transactional nature. It is it is really something tough to deal with, especially legislators that are new. Um, you know, they come in and and it's. You know, you, you want to support legislation that is good, um, and you know you're trying to get a bill pushed forward, and uh, you, 
can't get it done, and then somebody else wants something, and then that that's the part that I really try to avoid, and that is is frustrating you know, as a member of the legislature. Were you surprised <laughs> the governor put out a statement um, after when the session was over? He seemed angry. I've been extremely disappointed in the behavior of a few of our legislature over the last few days and for months now I've been demanding and he, and he goes on and on and then towards the end if the rhetoric from a few members wasn't bad enough the special interests and the lobbyists came in and tried to hijack things he got everything he wanted Are you a little surprised by the surprise no anger um, no uh, and I don't know that it's it, again, it gets frustrating, and I don't know. I, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding, given the legislature, the legislation that was passed, what special interests or lobbyists that really would have had uh, to be up in arms over that. So I don't I don't know who and I, he's referring to. I, I don't know who he's referring to either on on that side. Uh, yeah, may, our next guest may have some indication as to who mm -hmm. he's talking about in the legislature, but I, I don't want to speculate as to who he... Perhaps it involves a mirror? Is it? <laughs> I, I didn't say that. <laughs> but uh, I think that it's, you know, that I think the governor and the, and the legislative leadership probably thought they, the governor probably thought he had a deal worked out, everything was going to go smoothly. And then there's some folks that, that say, no, I'm not quite ready to do that, or that's not the path that I want to take it. And, um, you know, it kind of goes off the rails a little bit. But at the end of the day, the bill passed everybody's happy or well, should be and just did, it's just part of the sausage making didn't i read there were like 15 items on the call and y'all were the senate was done with them in like 20 minutes it was all yes to all of them and done could be could be they, they were done <laughs> immediately yeah and, and just for the folks that are on the outside looking in it, it's not like these bills just rolled out and we didn't read them or the, the members that were there didn't understand what they were voting on we, we get these bills a few days in advance um but the, the idea and and you know when they're just supplementals you know reading the supplemental is not really necessary it's okay it's x number of dollars and it goes to to this project or it goes to this agency or sometimes supplementals can simply be spending authority where the agency already has the money they just don't have the authority to spend it and the, the legislature has to pass um, a supplemental to be able to do that so it, it you know to the to the average person that may be looking at, at this that it's may appear haste uh, that is done hastily, but it's it's really not. It's it these it, things are. It vetted. took less than forty five minutes to read all fifteen bills. I mean, they weren't right. very complicated. It was very easy to understand what each of those bills were doing, and we did know about them a number of days in advance. So, the the Senate is just a lot more uh, efficient, and that they can get together in one room, sit and talk about it, and like, okay, we can just. just We'll suspend rules and, and get them through. So yeah, it's, it's just a different animal. Yeah. And these bills came from the governor, right? Mm -hmm. So both houses got the same bills. So, yes, we both houses got the same bills, and they started, both of them started, 15 started in the House and 15 started in the Senate. We ended up using most of the Senate bills, except for one House bill was the one that we used to, to get over. Um, the uh, The House just decided to... You know, spend some more time on it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you ask the House what time it is and they'll build you a clock. It's just, it's just part of the process. Yeah. So what was, I know you weren't, you were, what would the Senate be doing while, I mean, y'all are done, right? You've sort of voted it and it's done. And then the House, you're still in the, session. They're watching on TV the, 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 the House show. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Of course, it, it, while this House is in session, well, what happens is, if and did you guys send bills to committee? We did. We, sent, we sent two bills to to the Finance Committee. Yeah, so during that time, there are still interim meetings. As long as the House isn't actually in session, um, then those interim committees will still meet. Um, but if they're in, if they're in session, uh, actively debating or reading bills on the floor, then those interim meetings cannot uh, cannot happen until the session is over. So uh, I would imagine that even though that some of them went through the committee, um, they didn't, you all did suspend rules and pass them on the first day, right? You kind of kick that down. So they just go in, they read the bills the first time. Um, we, we did suspend rules uh, for each, most of them and get, get them to the third reading. Okay. You know, with, with the ability to. Yeah. So even though it takes a couple of days, it doesn't take them hours at a time on the floor until, you know, you get one bill where they debate pretty hot and heavily, but, but there's still plenty of work for the Senate to do while waiting on the House. So, so <clears throat> give us a peek behind 
I write thrillers, okay? So give us, give me, a peek, y'all just listen in, a, a peek behind the scenes, now that there's this power vacancy, there's a vacuum, what is happening in terms of people who are, who really want to be Senate president? What, what happens? Are, are people making deals? You know, do you really want your thing? Um, yeah, I don't, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I can tell by the, the grin on your face that, um, that it's just going to be probably disappointing because it's not the, as of right now, it is not what you may think or hope that it is uh, from an entertaining standpoint, an entertainment standpoint. There are there are people making some phone calls. They're having conversations. I have not and don't know of any uh, deal making from, okay, you support me. You get this position. We run this legislation i don't i think it's incredibly early um I'm, uh, hopefully that kind of again that transactional nature can can stay out of this race a, a little bit and i don't even know if it's going to be a race it may again it may be a consensus candidate that, that everybody can get behind and, and move forward i think that's really what our our caucus needs and that's what i'm going to advocate for do you have an idea in your in your head of who the top five likeliest candidates are for president yes you want to share that list? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, part of it is because it's very early. I haven't talked to all of them. Um, and I th- again, I'm going to say this again because it's important that, that Senator Rucker, who's my co-senator, um, I think it's very important for she and I to, to have the conversation and, and do everything we can to get on the same page. And I'm optimistic we will do that. Do, you, do most senators work that way? They, they work with their co-senator? Is, is that, are you paired up like that in the Senate? Is that... Ca- um, Pretty standard? No. Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that. I, okay. I guess I should say. I, I you think and Patricia that, talk, obviously. Yeah, I think we we certainly want to do that. And yeah. I, I would imagine that all of them will do that. Okay. Um, just they may not all be on the same page. But, you know, I think it's a, a mutual respect that you show your co-senator um, whether, uh, you know, it d- doesn't matter whether you're going to support the same person or not. You, you try to have the conversation. You can see, um, listen to their perspective and, and why they may be supporting uh, one person or not. And um, I think it's just important to try to get on the same page. And we got just a couple more minutes left. What's your thoughts on what happens with uh, Senator Trump's position and when do you think that actually gets appointed? Do you think that goes at the end of the year? What's your thoughts or I'm not what do you know about it? I'm not entirely sure of the judi- the judicial timeline uh, for the uh, uh, for Senator Trump uh, to become uh, a justice on the intermediate on the um, Western Supreme Court. I, I think that takes that th- that position takes office in very early or at the beginning of January. Uh, so I would expect some type of resignation prior to that. I, that that's just a speculation. I, I don't know. I haven't had any conversations with him right. about that. So um, if it happens in the 2024 year before t- December 31, would uh, Jim Justice get to appoint the position? Yes, that's my understanding. And, and again, now you and then have, after January 1, it would be Pat, uh, well, Patrick. Well, maybe. Maybe. Well, the new governor doesn't take offices until the second, I believe, the second Wednesday in January. Okay. That's when that inauguration. Again, I'm, I'm speculating the timeline, so right. forgive me, and I'm not, somebody can please correct me if I'm wrong. But but now we're getting into when does the United States senator take office? Yeah. Is that in December? Is that the beginning of January? Is there a time period from when Governor Justice becomes Senator Justice in a time, in, in a a window of time that Patrick Morrissey is not sworn in a governor, and does the current Senate president, the acting lieutenant governor, become the acting governor for a small window of yeah. time? I don't know the answer to those questions. Right. I'll be eager to find out. We'll try and get some research done on that. Well, that brings us to the end of the first segment, Thursday edition without Rob. Uh, co-hosting today, New York Times best-selling author, John Gilstrap. Thanks, John, for coming in. Good morning. Appreciate you. And a holdover from the last segment, Senator Barrett will be uh, staying with us and questioning our next guest, Mr. Delegate Hype. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure how much of that I want to really do. I mean, <laughs> you know. You're going to get some wisdom? Yeah, well, he gets fired up sometimes. I don't want him to come after me. But. The Badger was fired up uh, at, at, at special session. He uh, very passionate about the one bill, and uh, he, he let people know how he felt. Mike? I did. 
Yeah. Um, most of the bills, I think, were fine. And like you said in the earlier segment, you know, you get a chance to read all these bills at a time. Um, but one stood out. It was the DHS bill um, that that was supposed to sort of backfill the cuts um, and restore all of those. Um, and I just didn't like the way they did it. Um, you know, it was $183 million just in one lump sum. And it was, you know, trust trust DHS to put it in the right places. And uh, I, I just don't like budgeting that way. To me, that's not budgeting. You know, if, you, if you're going to do it that way, why not just get them all the money and just say, hey, DHS, just use it wherever you need to use it. And to me, that was just ridiculous. It was, um, it was skirting our responsibilities as legislators. It is our job to, to uh, make sh- to, to look at the, the governor's budget and agree to uh, the money line item by line item, and it is for the agency to stay within that budget. Okay, I'm a little lost. So, what's the alternative? 183 million dollars. As are you saying, 1.3 million dollars here and 2.7 million dollars there. What's no, what I'm saying is, so th- there were cuts to the the original budget, and I, a lot of that had to do with the clawbacks. And I get all that. Um, the word was we were going to come back in May and we were going to restore those cuts or, or as many of them as we possibly could. I expected to see a, a budget much like we saw in the regular session where money was restored. So you, you expect to see the line. bill to show where the, the restoring was going. Is that yes, correct? Yes, I mean, because and, and IDD was one of the big issues. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of the big issues because it was cut in the regular session. It was one of the big issues, um, you know, in interims in April. There were, there were um, protests um, at the Capitol uh, about the cut. And it in my opinion, I thought it was about restoring um, all of those cuts, particularly the IDD. So when the bill comes out and it just has a new line item, what what I would refer to as a big slush fund, um, with the responsibility put on DHS to backfill those cuts as they saw fit, there was no guarantee that they had to put the $11 million that they cut from IDD back into that line item. So we, we were sort of trusting them to do the right thing, and they have proven over and over again that they don't do the right thing. So I, I was concerned about that. Did you get the feeling that uh, because the bill was sent to finance that our leadership wanted us to do something about it? Yes, I, mean, I, I did. I mean, I thought the whole, you know, if, if it was... If it was, here's the the bill. We've already, you know, worked a deal behind closed doors. We've negotiated this negotiated for months. Negotiated yeah. all this ahead of time. Then tell us that. Yeah. And, and so that we're, we're aware of that. But when you come in and say, here it is, um, and there are some questions about it being $183 million all in one lump sum, and then they send it to finance, it to me, it seems like they want us to, you know, whatever your concerns are, work them out in committee. And, and come back with amendments if, if you feel like amendments are needed, which is what we did. We went and I sat in on that, that finance meeting. I believe it, the amendments were voted almost unanimously, on, um, except for I, one that failed, correct? There was one that had to do with um, uh, child, child care. care. Um, that, that passed, failed. but then it failed later. The, the, other, the other two, um, I, they weren't unanimous. I think they were more like, uh, you know, 14, 9, 15, 8, something like that. They pass, but not overwhelming. Okay. So the, the purpose of, the, of your amendments were to hold DHS more accountable for where the, the money went. That, Correct. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so then it goes back to the Senate. Well, and one of the amendments, it's really important, added some language that increased the reimbursement rate. I think the Senate took exception to that piece. Reimbursement rate of what to for, the, for IDD for the IDD uh, so to families to the providers providers. So I've heard some here recently this week. Um, some people come in and say that IDD was fully funded, um, and and that is technically correct. It was fully funded because DHS has been underspending in IDD for years now. So. 
when they say they cut it by eleven million and that dollars was, and it was still fully funded, that's technically correct because they've only been spending sixty or seventy million out of that. And that was line item. the reason Senator cut it in the last session. Yes, he said, well, which, you, you haven't been using it. We're going to cut that line item. And well, kudos to him XML. because that's what that's what it was that exposed the fact that D, until that point we didn't know DHS was not spending what they they had available to them. So I, I think it was Senator Tarr's cut that sort of exposed that. We we sort of wanted to know, you know, why why the cut came in. So we, you know we went back to DHS and said, tell us what your spend has been over the last four or five years for the IDD waiver. And their numbers came back at 50 or $60 million um, in some years of the 108 that we gave them. So our question at that point was, and, and this is some of the stuff we covered in April, is where did you spend all the other money? You know, where did the other 40 or $50 million that we gave you go? Because you spent it somewhere. And why were you moving 40 and 50% of a line item to other areas? Yeah, and, and the secretaries have the ability to do that. And so, I, obviously, I don't serve on uh, House Finance any longer, but was the DHS secretary there to ans answer questions about where the money would be appropriate and what this money would be used for? Um, no, the, the, um, the legal representative for the governor was there. Okay. And for, for the special session. For the special session, yes. Th that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And so, but... So, chief counsel for the governor was there to indicate what the money would be used for, and, and what did they indicate the money would be used well, for? Well, he did not indicate what the money would be used for, which is, when we questioned him, you know, our, our, some of the questions were like, this is $183 million, what was the purpose of it? His answer was to, to backfill the cuts. And then our question was, could it be used however DHS wants? Could they use $183 million and put it in one line item? And he said, yes. Could they, could they put it in something that, you know, doesn't have anything to do with IDD? The whole $183 million, yes. So all of this was, it wasn't broken down. There was no, no guarantee the DHS was going to spend it where the intent was. But even if it's put in a specific line item, those secretaries still have the ability to move money from one item to another. Only only 5%. Right. And, well, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest positive of that bill was that the paper tracking, they when they made a, a, a transfer, now they had to request... Right. Make give a reason why, and I like the way that in this particular bill. in this yes, particular that's bill that's the way it was structured because it, it it puts it in a reserve fund, and now when they transfer it out, they have to draw down on on yep. any line item, and I think that was a huge positive of this bill. Yeah, I think we have to. There's a balance between transparency and oversight of these agencies and not micromanaging them. Sure. And, and I think that what you guys were able to do in special session is kind of to strike some of that balance. And uh, just for the listening audience, you know, this has been uh, dividing up DHHR into three different agencies has been trying, but I think will be uh, very beneficial. The old way that the budget was done with DHHR was just a couple of pages out of the general revenue budget. Here are billions of dollars that mm -hmm. go to DHHR and it is spent, there, there wasn't accountability, there wasn't transparency. So what the legislature has done in the past couple of years is to break that into three agents, break that down into three different agencies, um, put more and more line items into the budget so that the legislators can see not only was, where is the money appropriate in the beginning, but at the end of the fiscal year, you see where it was actually spent. And I think that part is is where we have to follow. We can, we, we can have all the discussions and insist that the money go into specific line items at the beginning, but at the end of the fiscal year is when you really have to go in and see, was the money spent where we were told it was going to be spent and supposed to be spent. This right, and, sounds, I, and I think that's what we were trying to say there. Sure. That, that I applaud the fact that we're breaking it apart. There are more line items in the budget, and you can see where we're appropriating money for. So I, I applaud all that. That's what I didn't like about this particular bill, is it, it went back to the old way. We're just going to give you a chunk of money, and we hope you put it in the right line items where it's needed.
So what you're proposing seems like common sense. The process seems like regular order. So where did all the acrimony come from? Well, because it was, uh, I, I thought, because it was so much about IDD and not funding IDD, and when April came out and it showed that they were spending so much money in other areas outside of IDD, and there was such an uproar about that, the fact that they have been uh, talking about rate increases for IDD and that they did a study uh, two years ago uh, um, f about those rates. The independent study came back and said you need to raise the rates by 15 to 50 percent in some, some areas. And they are the DHS itself has said that the direct care um, portion of IDD is in crisis. Well, if it's in crisis, and you need to raise the rates, then why haven't you? And you've had 50 or $60 million that you've been spending on other things outside of IDD. So the IDD individuals are saying, why aren't you doing the rate increases? You've always had the money to do the rate increases. So I think in April they were saying, all right, well, if we restore the cuts, we'll have the money to their, do the rate increases. And those amendments that Chairman Summers put into the bill, that's all they did was forced DHS to implement the rate increases and restore the money that was cut from the IDD line item. That's all it did. And, and it forced it. Now, I, I get that some people don't want to put that in a bill. And there, and I heard say, well, you don't want code, to put it right? in code. Yeah. It's not in code. It's in a one-time bill. It, that, that portion of it would have expired at the end of 2025. So it's not really in code. So it was just to force their hand because they haven't done the right thing over and over and over again. And it was just to say, we don't trust you. We're going to put it in this bill that you have to do it. But I think the accountability now is much better because every month they will be reporting what these transfers are out of this reserve account. So, well, so, and we're supposed to come back. There's, yeah. there's talk about us coming back in, in August and doing another special yeah. special session. So we'll have a few months of seeing whether or not they've, they've implemented doing. the rate increases and whether or not that money was put back into the right line item. And hopefully they have, because if not, it's going to be a big deal all over again. Right. So, so this was ultimately passed? So, yeah, so what happened, John, yeah. is... Um, it, the House decided to go ahead and make these amendments and, and change it, and we sent it, and there was a, a, another amendment where they couldn't take any money, they couldn't transfer any money out of IDD waivers. So the Senate took it up and, and liked the idea that you couldn't transfer out, um, but they did not agree with the House message. Um, and they adjourned. The House the, message being... So, so what happens is the, the, the bill goes from the House to the Senate, and the Senate either has to agree or they can say no and send it back. So they sent it back without the, the First Amendment but kept the Second Amendment. Um, and well, actually, that, that's, that's not true. That's, that's the word we got, but that didn't happen. If you look at the language, it didn't come. What they did was they struck all of our amendments and, and reinserted their own language yeah. back to what it was with without the Second Amendment. With Daniels. No, no, it didn't no. have it in there. Right. Um, so it came back to us the way it came over the first time. They essentially said to our amendments, no, we're not doing that. You're going to get it. You're going to take it the way we gave it to you. And that's the end of it. That's that's when I stood up and said, you know, I'm I'm tired of being bullied by the Senate. You know, it, sometimes you have to stand on principle and fight. Normally, if you send it back to them and say, we don't concur, it, it goes to conferees. You, you, go right. to, you have a conference, you get together, and you do it. Um, so we, sent, a, we sent it back to them. Yeah, we sent it back yeah. to them. The Senate didn't take it up at all and just went <laughs> sine die. This is not, there's <laughs> not going to be a conference. We're not going to talk to you about it. We sent it to you the way it was. That's, so in the end, we had to reconsider our action not to concur, so it was a whole, you know, <laughs> it was a mess. We had to reconsider <laughs> and then vote on what they sent us and accept it, or we wouldn't have gotten any of the money restored to those line items. So everything passed exactly the way 
the Senate the sentence. Senate and the governor. Uh, sounds like you guys leadership. need to learn how to play chess, uh, chess and quit playing checkers. I, That's what you know, like. The Senate was playing uh, dodgeball, Jason. They, they weren't playing chess. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's important is, you know, there are... There is a, co a joint committee, government and finance, and, and they do the accountability uh, and, and are able to do that through the through interims and, and get into these agencies and really, um, you know, make sure that these things are, are money is being spent appropriately and that they are that the agency is following what the intent of the legislature was as it relates to, to some of the spending. But, you know, I, I still come back to this is a an executive agency function. There has to be some level of trust for them to do their job. Um, with that being said, it is still our job. I mean, we still control the purse strings, and it is still our job to hold them accountable. There just has to be that balance, and I, I think that we're uh, with the new way that w with dividing the DHHR into three agencies by breaking down the line, line items the way that we have. Um, I think is really starting to strike that balance. And, but, and and that part was in the bill, and I like that part of the bill that that over you know quarterly or whatever it was they had to come back to that Honestly, that, to that the legislator legislative oversight that government accountability and and tell them where the money's being spent so i i like that portion of it and i think there needs to be more of that what what irritated me was this wasn't on the legislator it irritated me that the governor came out and called out legislators you know dhs i i'm pretty sure is an executive branch uh agency the governor could have gone to DHS and said, implement the rates increases. Do it. And, and none of this would have been a mess. This dog's mess that he says it was, was his dog making the mess. And then we're tiptoeing around the mess and making it look like we're the ones that are the, the issue. No, Mr. Governor, this was you. This was your mess. You should have fixed it. John? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you talk about trusting the executive branch agencies to you know, have their discretion, but if they don't spend $60 million of a budget, I mean, that's not Trump change. And, and actually, there's another question. There is $60 million unspent dollars. Do we call that a surplus at, at the end of that year? Is that, is that become part so of only if we, of claw we call back, that? Only if we claw back within, um, but most of these agencies... They'll have reappropriated we'll dollars have reappropriated from, dollars. from one fiscal year yeah. to the next. Yeah. Because this is, as as a non-legislator and as a citizen and a, and a voter, and, and you look at the state of so many things in West Virginia, from the educational system to, you know, the mental health crises and all of this, when when we see the dickering and the the hoarding of tens of millions of dollars that go unspent. This is really concerning. And when you, and Jason, you say that we have to trust the agencies to spend the money that they have a history of not spending, that rings kind of hollow. Well, I, I think that there has to be some trust. I think that you certainly have to hold them accountable. You have to, again, break these line items down so at the end of that fiscal year, you can see these things. We haven't been able to see those things until very recently because it was just these a couple of line items uh, under DHHR and, and a few billion dollars. We're getting to the point to be to, to have that transparency and accountability and, and we should have more of that. Uh, but you also can't handcuff the agency um, because w the legislature is only in session 60 days. We have some special session. We, we can't handcuff them where we have to come in session every month. And appropriate a, money to them because they, they need more. Or, or, or move it from one yeah. account to another because they don't have that necessary flexibility if they run into a crisis or, or run into to some unforeseen problems. And he's right about that. They do have to have some flexibility. But I, I think it's this this breaking out of line items and the more transparency that has angered a lot of legislators to say, why haven't you been spending the money correctly? You know, and, and it's not 50 or $60 million that they're not spending, you know, that that IDD money wasn't because they didn't spend it. They spent it somewhere else. So they didn't spend it where the legislature wanted them to spend it, where we authorized them to spend it. And I think that's the biggest frustration. And it's not just IDD, it's on other, other areas as well. And this has all been exposed by us uncovering and putting things in separate line items. And it's only been done in the last year. So 
it's it's hard to hold them accountability when you didn't know where things were going. So I, I think it's a better system now. We're getting there. Breaking it all apart has helped. Um, but there's some there's some fight that has to go on going forward so when the governor says quote i've been extremely disappointed in the behavior of a few of our legislators and legislators in the past few days unquote what are the chances he's talking about the recalcitrance of the senate (laughs) i I don't think so there was no fight in the senate i mean they they passed everything without a peep but the, the 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 Lack of willingness to negotiate with the other house isn't that what the well, process think, is supposed to be all about? Agree. When I, I see, when I hear this story right. again, as as a not involved person, <clears throat> I I hear forgive me. It's it's kind of like the juvenile chest knocking thing. You know, you guys go do your thing. We're going to do our thing. We're done. We're bigger. We're better. And y'all go and, and I don't think that that's, different different again, sand, I, I sand wasn't boxes. The, I wasn't there for that special session. I, I highly doubt that's the way that it went down. That's probably the way that it, that it uh, is portrayed and, and seen that way. But again, these aren't these issues have been going on for months. I think that these conversations among legislative leadership has been agreeable uh, to the position of the agency and the governor's office. And whether that's always communicated all the way down through rank and file members. And I think that's where the rank and file thought we were doing what I, what our leadership wanted us to do. And that was just not the case. No, our, our leadership felt like they had already negotiated this deal and it was settled matter. So I think our leadership was upset when certain people stood up and, and made a mess of things. So it all shakes out. Are there... Are, are the citizens of West Virginia best served and better off? Yes. I, I, I certainly believe so, looking back uh, and now kind of seeing where all everything was laying and how it actually worked. I, I do think this will be way better for West Virginia moving yeah, forward. I agree. You know, leadership can be mad at, at Chairman Summers. They can be mad at me. They can be mad at some of the other people that stood up and spoke. That's good. But it also exposes some things as well. Whether you get... In the end, it came out this, the same way, but I think it exposes some things, and and it exposes some things with uh, DHS that that the legislature doesn't trust them. So you better, you know, dot your eyes and cross your t's because we're watching. If nothing else, I'm hoping they got that message. Yeah, I think the house usually wants to discuss. We, we discuss way more than we've got a hundred members. You got a hundred alpha personalities down there. Everybody's got everybody thinks they're the smartest person in the room and they've got the greatest idea that, that, that they have and some people I mean we, we had members make amendments that just were just impossible to do um, on, on certain bills because they just didn't understand if you don't sit in and, and really under, like sitting in on finance has been uh, very eye-opening, and if you if you're not on that committee, you don't pay attention, then you don't know a lot about the budget. You know, you can't just move stuff and, and make amendments wherever you want. So, all right, we're going to take another break. It is nine o'clock on Thursday. New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap joining us today. Good Thank morning. you, John. Appreciate it. Delegate Michael Height, thanks for for joining us, and Good still with us, Senator Bear. Is there a reason we had to endure that opening twice? It's <laughs> just the way the producer does it, and I think it's a great opening. Yeah, I think you, a lot of effort was put in, a lot of love was felt in yeah. there. From I wonder if me. there are alternative versions that he didn't show you that were maybe not quite uh, as. Uh, <laughs> Compliment. I, you're the writer. I think you should come up with it. <laughs> Probably not suitable for on air, but appropriate. <laughs> so let's uh, switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk about these past elections, um, obviously across the state. Um, a lot of extremely conservative um, Republicans were, were elected um, here in Berkeley County. Um, we had... Uh, Two, two, uh, one Don Forst, uh, you know, incumbent lost to to uh, DeSoto, and, and Chris Anders beat uh, Pam Brush. What are your thoughts on that, and how does the Republican um, Party move forward, Mike? Well, I, obviously, those two candidates are probably farther right than I am. Um, so I, I, I sort of see the electorate. Um, you know, choosing people farther to the right statewide, so, and it happened here in Berkeley County. We've always been pretty conservative county, um, so uh, I'm not entirely surprised by that. Um, 
I, I was surprised, I would say, probably more with the uh, the DeSoto race um, than I was with the Chris Sanders race. Um, and only because I, I felt like uh, with DeSoto, the, the campaign got so ugly. And um, I think his ads were probably the ugliest. They were really nasty in some regards and i think that goes to the character and that usually of doesn't individual. work in in, in berkeley I mean, county the, what, the negative right i mean i don't know that it doesn't past. i mean I've, it, it seems like all the negative campaigns are the ones that won so to me it's it's telling me that these negative campaigns are working right. people are believing what is being said in these campaigns um but when you come out and call somebody um a, a groomer yeah, I don't know how you get away with that. I, that that one sort of irritated me. Um, you know, I know Don Forrest. He's not a groomer. I don't know where you get off saying that in a, in a campaign ad. Um, but he did. He won. People bought it. So, uh, you know, going forward, it, all it says is we're going to have more and more uh, campaigns like that. Jason? I think these negative ads in this cycle were some of, and I'm not going to point any fingers at one group, or one candidate or another, but I, they were the worst that I've seen. And, and certainly yeah. in, in the past, I, I've run contrast contrast ads uh, against some of my opponents, uh, but never personal attacks uh, the way that, that I've seen um, in this cycle. And it's unfortunate. And, you know, the, you, it, it's unfortunate that the law protects um, some of those ads, because if it was, if, if you can't say those things about an individual that you could say about a political candidate, correct? And, and the threshold, you know, for for something to be slanderous or, or or liable, it should be higher for public officials. But there has to be a standard, and and you know, th- th- all of us that that run locally, you know, we all live in this community, we work in this community, our families see this stuff. Um, and you wonder why more people don't want to run for office. Well, who the hell wants to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to put this giant target on my back, and you just throw whatever crazy attack that you want, say whatever ridiculous thing that you want. doesn't matter if there's a shred of truth to it, and you can't do anything about it, but get down in the mud um, and, and do the same thing back. And, and it's unfortunate. I, I think that, that something has to be done um, you know, to be able, I'm not saying protect elected officials. That's, that's not where I want to go with this. But, but, but you, you shouldn't be able to say things that don't have a shred of truth to them um, in, in these small communities like this where, you know, my grandmother's 93 years old and she has to listen to some of this garbage that, that you see right. as attacks on me. And I, it's not just me. It's, it's, it's Actually, this this like I'm low on the ballot, so I didn't get it. But there were plenty of people that did. Um, I think we have to be better than that. Um, and I don't know that voters respond to that. It's easy to say that they do, given um, the outcome of some of these races with with the negative attacks. Uh, but turnout was extremely low. Do you think the turnout was low because of all the negativity? I, I th- yeah, I think it does. I, th- I think that that when when people see. Um, negative attacks on every candidate, voters look and say, I don't want to vote for any of these people because there may be some truth to some of this stuff. And and the problem is that when people in the Eastern Panhandle don't win, don't vote, Charleston and the rest of the state wins. And that's the message I think that we have to, to tell voters is, look, we, we had a couple of statewide candidates from the Eastern Panhandle uh, that that came up short in their their races, and you look at the turnout in our area versus and you run yeah. against somebody. They run against somebody from Canal County where they have a much higher turnout. When Eastern Panhandle voters stay home, Charleston wins, and that's the message we need. To Less to people to voted in Berkeley County than voted in Cabell County, and we have almost double the amount of registered voters. I think there's real. I need a mic. I think there's real danger in misinterpreting the results of the election here because it was a 17 percent turnout and because the candidates we elected are so far right and they're so far right on frankly forgive me kind of odd items you know this chemical castration nut stuff and and they ran on a uh, the platform of no compromise you know we're not we're not going to do any deal making we're going to stand on our principles and uh, just uh, no compromise at all. That is not what most people think. So if other politicians interpret the, the, the standards that we happen to elect in this last cycle as the future of the Republican Party, 
the Republicans are going to lose power because I, I don't I don't think that kind of um, uh, wild far right thinking resonates with the any, any more than the far left re thinking resonates with the average Democrat. The far right thinking does not resonate with the average Republican. So I, this could be the beginning of the the pendulum swing the other way. So I really I, th I think that Republicans need to be careful about not charging too far to the right uh, by misinterpreting the results. Simply because the the, the sample was so small, seventeen percent is like four people, right? I mean, it's just it's not it's, well, it's who turned out, but it's a very small sample. But that's in Berkeley County. You can look across the state, and it, and we became more conservative across the state, and there was a higher turnout in those areas as well. the 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 odd thing is, West Virginia has been pretty red. We're pretty conservative as a state, and we just got even more conservative, and not just in Berkeley County. But across the state, we got more conservative um, with with people who are farther to the right. So it, it'll be an interesting session coming up and seeing how all those dynamics play out and whether or not that that what people consider far right um, caucus takes over. Is it the you know, the Freedom Caucus gained individuals here in uh, in, in this session? I think that you have to look at what I would read into some of this is isn't this um, far right conservative moderate I, don't, I think it's more about the type of campaigns that were run in some of these areas when you you know we had you know the, the most hotly contested Republican primary for governor that I With can four, ever for quality candidates that, that right? I can remember. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly people much older than I am probably don't remember one more contested than this. Um, but when you're talking about a House of Delegates race and, and, and you have the U.S. Senate, the governor's race, all these Board of Public Works, um, all these other races, and then you get down ballot as far as the House of Delegates, it's hard to break through. It's hard to compete um, with ads, whether it's you know on the radio or it's on digital, you're welcome, digital, uh, whether it's direct mail, any of those things. When those campaigns that are running statewide, statewide have millions of dollars at their disposal, it's hard to compete uh, with ads when you're in a House of Delegates race. So, um, you know, I think the individuals that won just ran better campaigns and they figured out a way to reach voters. I, I think if some of those other individuals would have run better campaigns, even though they may not be viewed as um, as as conservative as our, our far right, whatever term you want to use, I think had they run better campaigns, they, they may have been um, successful. I think it's more about that than it is I, I some do of the think, ideological stuff. Yeah, you look at those races and yes, the candidates probably ran a better Right, you 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 only had to get six, five, six hundred people to vote for you in in those races to win, and I think it comes down to the numbers when when it comes to. And sometimes it's money too. There's right. there's a lot of money thrown in some of these delegate races of all things. You know, you only have a turnout of of eighteen hundred to two thousand people in a race, and and yet you see thousands and thousands of dollars dumped into certain races to, right. to unseat some. Uh, an incumbent in a lot of uh, a lot of areas, so um, it got interesting across the state. Do you think if a candidate had an ad campaign that was visionary, instead of hammering everything that's wrong, there was it was we suck, we have sucked for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to make us suck less. It was kind of the drumbeat of these campaigns. If if somebody ran a campaign that West Virginia is a beautiful place, I'm going to make it more beautiful. We do have problems, but we're going to be the shining star, shining city on the hill. You know, sort of the kind of that Ronald Reagan morning in America, morning in America kind of kind of campaign with good ads, good commercials. Do you think, given the negative campaigns that are out there, would that have well shown above? Mac, do you think that Mac would Warner resonate? showed up force? I mean, he, he ran a positive campaign he did he did, did not spend as much money as as the rest but he only ran a positive campaign and he did but he's not a dynamic communicator i think he's a really great guy I think he's, on paper he's probably the most qualified candidate for governor but you can only do so much with a few hundred thousand dollars yeah you can only you can only do so much with a few hundred thousand dollars in a governor's race and so I, I, I think his showing, and I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head but for the amount of money he spent it was a pretty decent showing oh yeah absolutely
And, and Craig Blair didn't go negative either. Um, his his campaign ads were all positive in nature, um, and it didn't seem to help him a lot. Craig never hit why it's important to have the president of the Senate in your district. That was I I think that was. Well, I the, think that can, that's could the, also come back and and, and bite you when you, when you ask you you look at what's happening in Berkeley County and and. Uh, Morgan and, and Hampshire, it's you, you've been the pre Senate president, and we still have an issue here. So you can bring up all the negative of you know that that leadership position can hurt you um, having that title too. Do you th is it a career death sentence to become president? Is, is it I mean, you're you're in the Senate and you know you got a political career ahead of you? And I'm not asking you to commit one way or the other, or even you know <laughs> postulate okay. whether it's, it's something you'd be interested in. But is it a consideration for, uh, as a as president, Senate president, you just can't spend as much time in, in your own district? So is that kind of an end of the career thing, a consideration that there's negatives associated? Well, just, I'm not currently running for Senate president, uh, okay. so I want to clear that up first. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the current Senate president and the, and the previous Senate president, you have to think some of that. But if you look back at, at Earl Ray Tomlin, who was, I forget how long he was a Senate president. He was a Senate president a long time. And, and he didn't, he was able to. Um, yeah, he only left it to win the governorship, correct? That's right. He, yeah. he left and um, when the Senator Byrd died and then that kind of domino uh, effect happened. And um, Earl Ray left uh, the Senate president to become the governor. And it was several terms that he was the Senate president. So. Um, again, it's a balance of, of being able to, to do what's best in your district and, and be there and be, be seen. What's, what's hard, um, I think, in the Eastern Panhandle is, and that's different than or away from Logan, it was the same folks voting in every election there. You know, his yeah. family was very well known. There is an influx of new people coming in where you don't have to, you know, worry about new voters. Here in the Eastern Panhandle, the, the people that are voting now are very different. I mean, there are still a lot of the same people here, but but you, we've had um, such an influx of people coming into the Eastern Panhandle. They may not know who I am or who the Mikes are or, or mm -hmm. Craig Blair is because they're new. And, you know, so it's um, uh, you, you, the incumbent doesn't start with the lead here that the way they do in other parts of the state where they've just been they're kind of an institution um, in those seats. You make a uh, bring up a great point that that the influx of new people in the northern part of our county and the western part of our county has has been huge, and that's the part of the count or the yeah the part of the county that his district was in, and then in the Morgan and Hampshire as well. Um, I think one of the mistakes that if you look back on on Craig is it's perception is uh, are you are you here are you doing things for our district and whether you are or not there was a perception he wasn't um, so it's, there are times when you have to beat your own chest you have to let the the people know what you're doing and how you're working in your district and how you're working for the state as a whole well I'll tell you this I mean we uh we made a donation to um, the American Legion uh, baseball um, tournament. They're having the state tournament up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were out there to present the check to trip because um, you know, I don't know if you've seen that field. It's absolutely amazing. Beautiful. But we got hammered for, oh, this is just electioneering. I mean, for you know, when you want to beat your chest and say, hey, this is what we got from Charleston for Berkeley County or something like that, sometimes it, it comes back and bites you. It, it seems ludicrous, yeah. but... Well, it, it was it was the media that was hammering us. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think the people still want to know what you're doing right. and how you're helping your, your district. Um, so sometimes you have to do it by word of mouth. You, you know, sometimes you have to show up at the baseball game. Right. Sometimes you have to show up at the football game on Friday night. And sometimes you still have to be a part of the community, um, whether it's having a business here like Jason, myself, you all do. Right. Craig sold his business and sort of became a full-time... Um, a politician in Charleston and people I think people looked at it that he became uh, 
you know, part of the, the Charleston machine instead of being part of his community. And whether that's true or not, it's about perception in politics. And I think that was a perception. And like Jason said, so many new people moving in who just didn't know Craig and, and were listening to the ads and what was going on. And that's how they were forming their opinion. Now, the big race we really talk about very little here is Alex Mooney. Was that doomed the instant that um, Justice said he was going? Jim Justice is the most popular man in West Virginia. Yeah. He, he, his Teflon. I mean, the, the man, he, the people love him. And, you know, if there's nothing you can say that, or there's nothing he could do that if he wants that seat, as long as he wants that seat, he'll have it. I think that any political strategist, analyst, that tries to understand Governor Justice's popularity in, in the way that he, uh, the relationship that he has with the people of West Virginia. Um, if any analyst or strategist were, were trying to examine that, I think the only thing they would come away with is a headache. Yes. Uh, it is just, I, I don't have an explanation for it. Y'all need to buy a big fat dog. It uh, works. Yeah, he was popular before the big fat yeah, dog. So I mean, I, Jason's absolutely right. I, I've, I've stopped trying to figure it out. And, and to your original question, John, about, you know, can a campaign have a more inspiring, uplifting message and be successful? I mean, I sure hope so, because that's the type of campaign I'm going to run in two years. But, um, but also, I think you can. I think that you can be successful. I think that... Um, that that is really what I hope these campaigns locally get back to, uh, but at the same time you can't rope a dope. I mean you can't you can't just take it constantly and not not fire back or, or do something. And and the old saying in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing, is that you know what all these political strategists and these folks that run campaigns they will tell you. Look, when you get attacked, you don't defend the attack; you just attack back, and that's why you get this. Um, you know, this constant back and forth and it turns people off. And, you know, I hope that the candidates in two years locally can, can take a step back and, and not. But nobody go. wants the sound bite that I'm going to create right now, but I'm not a politician. I am not for the chemical castration of children. I mean, that's just, you, nobody wants to create that sound bite. So what do you, it, it, especially during a campaign season, because it's, it's begging the question, right? So I, I, I do think you have to address it, though. And, but the, yeah, I think it's the way you address it. You just shake it off. Says that's just ridiculous. That's a ridiculous comment. And then you go on and and you talk about what you've done for your district and for the state and the policies you support and and a positive, upbeat message. But that's fine for an incumbent. Well, okay, but you, you also have to do it, even if you're not an incumbent and somebody's attacking you in those regards, you just have to say, that's that's ridiculous. I don't know where they're coming up with that. That's ridiculous. This is my stance. And and like Jason says, you have to you have to come with a positive message. Uh, I, I, I like that idea, but when somebody's attacking you, I, I kind of agree with Jason. you got to get on the attack, too. So uh, is that that's, that's ad for changed. ad? I mean, yeah. do, do you, when somebody comes out with an attack ad, you got to buy another... To attack ad to go to go back. I mean, that's great. It's okay. always always good idea to buy ads. Uh -huh. So <laughs> buy as many ads what, as you can. <laughs> what I don't like about it is there are a lot of these candidates that are hiding behind packs that yes. they're forming packs to do the dirty work, and and it's the packs that are are making all these accusations, and then the candidate can stand back and say, I, I didn't say any of that. I mean, I'm not I'm not getting in the middle of that. That's the pack. You know, one of the things that I think candidates make a mistake of is that, you know, somebody will put some negative comment on Facebook or they'll, they'll have some yeah. uh, Facebook group and, and there'll be some attack and, you know, it gets very little traction. And then the candidate who got the attack, who is the, the attack was made on, they will engage and start and they're bringing more attention to it than the people that actually posted it. So, I mean, I think some of these folks, you just have to realize that, okay, they're going to make their attacks. They're going to get four likes. Forget it. Move on. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. it's just, and a lot of people will try and suck you down that rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, they do. And, 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 and you want to be able to defend yourself. You don't want you to somewhat let somebody get away with saying something crazy about you. So it's, it's easy to take the bait, but um, it's better just not but it's it's a hard thing to do when, it is. again you you live and work in the community your family's here and you're getting some crazy attack on you you want to tell them you know what the truth is and what you think of their ad but you know and we say that it occurs to me that is donald trump's greatest weakness he cannot 
just look away. No. And, and, you know, he... <laughs> I think when it comes to my campaign, when somebody goes uh, goes negative, and there's been times people go negative, it's holding my wife back from, from going nuclear. <laughs> Sounds been, familiar. Yeah, has been my, uh, my issue, is holding Crusher back, because she, she's... she's Willing to die on every hill that, that that comes along and go after anybody that even says one minuscule one kind yeah. of bad thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you get away from some of this negative stuff, especially when when the candidates keep winning, and it it looks effective. You know, when you go negative and you win. Then everybody says, well, it worked. So that's the strategy I have to go to next. I'm not so, so sure it's not going to take a lawsuit over some of these. Again, the, the standard is high uh, for attacking a, a political um, official or elected official. Uh, the standard's high, but um, I, I think that, that it's probably going to take something like that to get some of a federal standard at that, is it not? Yeah, but... Yeah, well, until it until it's challenged in court, and there's a, a court decision in West Virginia, it's it's going to continue, I think. Right. And that's so tough on the local level when you're talking. So who's going to spend the money? Who's going to spend that right. kind of money where you, you spend tens of thousands of dollars to prove that you have losses? I mean, but on that note, we come to the end of our um, segment. Let's on vacation all the way through Tuesday. We will be closed on Monday. Um, so that'll be, um, it'll be on automation. We'll just have, uh, the regular radio. We'll be back, back on Tuesday. And I am joined by my co-host, John Gilstrap, Mike Height. Thanks for joining me on the last segment. We were supposed to have an author on, but I thought we could talk about, we're going to be having a forum next week, um, because in two weeks, there'll be a city election. So incumbent, uh, Kevin Knowles will be joining us Wednesday. And Yvonne Jenkins will be joining us. I think it's going to be Wednesday morning, and then we'll go through all the uh, the city council races. So either Wednesday or Thursday, the show will go all the way to eleven, and we'll have uh, individual uh, forums for all those races. But not 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 on at the same time. Yes. Are they, so you'll have the candidates on at the all same the time. candidates on the same time in a debate um, setting. In, in, a, okay. in a debate setting, a forum yeah. setting, but Great. each race separately. Good. So. Very nice. Uh, it should be fun. I think the uh, election is uh, Tuesday in June, or um, I, I still don't know why they do it like that in the municipal elections, but hopefully the legislature can change that and make it. Uh, I, I, I thought that we did, and it goes into effect January of 25, but somebody told me that we did not get, did it, not get it through. No, it, it, it went to uh, Dine Senate it or something. went to Judish, and uh, Tom Fast would not run it. Or did sure. not run it. This but will be my first experience to city elections here. What are the issues typically at the at the city level? Well, it, turnout is the it's abysmal um, at the city level. Well, I mean, but but what are the concerns for the most part? I mean, you, in 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 the state, you got education, you got homelessness, you got the drug. Well, I mean, drugs are going to be an issue, but I'm not sure if that's a, a city thing. But I would say services. The way the, the you know you, when you live in the municipality, you. you you definitely get taxed more, so um, you expect more of your services. Um, but I'd look forward to seeing what Kevin and Yvonne say. Yeah, I would. I would say it seems to be not not as much services. It seems to be the odder things. It seems to be the things like Lambert Pool and why haven't we done this and why you know. It seems to be about the the complaint issues within the city and and why the city government hasn't done certain things. Um, you know the services. I, I, if you look at uh, the city, the services are pretty good. The, yeah. the, the trash pickup. Uh, you know, Jeff Wilkerson, I think, does an excellent job with the maintenance and keeping the city. Um, snow removal. Snow, snow removal. They do a great all that job. Stuff. Of that, yeah. So the services, I think, are pretty good. And you can look at the fire and EMS services. I think they're really great. Uh, you can look at the police force. I don't see any issues there. So when you look at services inside the city. I, I don't know what you complain about. So I, I think it'll be interesting when uh, you have the the candidate coming in running against the incumbent and, and ask them why. So I think Yvonne Jenkins, when she comes in and, and has this forum, this open seat, um, it'll be her job to explain why right. she needs to unseat the sitting incumbent. What what issues are so bad that we need to replace the mayor? So um, I think she may have a tough job ahead of her, but, you know, you never know. Yeah, I've, just seen, I've seen a lot of signs for both of them. 
Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I, I'd like to see that difference between them. I mean, I know I've been ke- friends with Kevin for a long time, but I'd definitely like to hear from the other candidate. I don't get to vote either way. I don't live in the city. But And the odd thing about the mayor in particular is, is uh, we have a weak mayor system in the city of Martinsburg. So uh, in a lot of ways, they're, they're a figurehead. Um, they don't run the city on a day-to-day basis. They basically set the agenda for the meeting, and the councilman do most of the sure. voting, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they don't get involved in the voting unless it's a tie, and they yeah. have to. So um, I think I think Kevin has taken a more hands-on approach to this than than past mayors, but it, it's still a weak mayor system, so your, your city administrator is doing the majority of the work. Well, I... I've, Kevin seems to be everywhere, and he's such a great cheerleader for the city. You know, he's very proud of of what's happened. And I've said this before. I think I might have talked about this even yesterday. I, I moved here in the depths of COVID when nothing was happening. It was mm-hmm. like scary quiet. Nobody on the streets it was like really strange. Um, so for me, the the change has been enormous. But it's nice to see new life coming coming in. There's a long way to go, I think, but I see so much potential. In, in Martinsburg. The, um, I think the infrastructure and the COVID money and a combination of, uh, of the uh, home rule, you have seen a transformation in our city recently. I mean, the sidewalks, I know they're not all perfect yet, but you can see that transformation when it comes to the parks, the signs, the, the value of the houses, I mean, is going up. There's a lot of people investing in Martinsburg. Yeah, I think the, the, there's a pride in the city that I haven't seen uh, in many, many years that is returning to the city of Martinsburg, and, and I really appreciate that. It looks like they're trying to make it look better. They're trying to get the real estate up and going, booming in downtown, so uh, you can look at the, the efforts of Main Street Martinsburg and, and what they're doing. So, uh, I, you know, I, I see a lot of improvements, um, and I, I'm, I don't only assume that Yvonne Jenkins um, is, is looking to improve upon it even more. Um, your thoughts, Mike, on what they're going to do with Lake Thomas? What, what, are they really, Do you think that's actually going to be you know, a that's viable recreational... About. It's been talked about for years and years, turning it yeah. into a recreational area and and where the access is going to be. And I'm, I'm assuming it would be down around where the, the water uh, plant is. Um, you would come in that direction. That's the lowest point, I believe. So I, I think that it could be viable. It's going to take a lot of money to, to make it. For private investment or on I, I would, city investment? I'm always about uh, private public investment. Okay. Um, I don't I don't want the government to have to fund everything. Um, my concern is it seems like there's also some um, stormwater management issues that are going through the city right now with the, the recent uh, rehabilitation of the old woolen mill. Yeah. Um, and it looks like the, the stormwater management is going to go into Lake Thomas. So that, that struck me a, a little bit as odd that you're going to open it up for recreational and yet it's also going to be where you're going to have your stormwater. Isn't that so, where it goes right now? It's just on a uh, smaller I I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. I, I just know they're expanding it, and, yeah. and it's going into there. So. Now, we went and toured that uh, project, and, and John, I, I'm, I'm getting you a tour here soon. Uh, that interwoven mill, those apartments are dynamic. Where is the entrance? I mean, the roads are all closed. Right, right next now. to the Apple. So okay. right, where, right where that road is closed. So um, you just can't get to the entrance. No, they have it sort of fenced off right now because they're still doing construction in there and they don't want anybody in there except for the construction vehicles. But um, there, and I think on Porter Avenue, there there's probably some parking there and an entrance on the Porter Avenue side. Depends on where your apartment is. But nominally, King Street is going to be the... Yeah, I would, I would think entrance, King Street yeah. would be the main uh, entrance and then there will the be one on uh, Winchester parking. Avenue probably coming across that way. So the main... the the. The old buildings on King and Queen, down on, in the on the old part of town. In what condition are those buildings in? If somebody wanted to go and move their offices into, you know, to put it above Boyd Steakhouse or above the, the so most shop most of those, those are actually apartments, and most of them are in really good shape and renovated. Good shape? Um, and, and people I think it depends on the building. Yeah, uh, um, but 
you know, it depends on the building, but there, there have been a lot of major renovations throughout downtown. And and I think it's the individual who's, who's done the investment. So you've had some, some individuals come in, the van meters have come in and bought a couple of buildings and have done a lot of renovations. I know H.D. Boyd has yep. a building down Drew there. Johnson. Done some, yep. some, some renovations down there. And I think maybe that's one of the problems with uh, the blue-white zone right now, that that particular building has not had the upkeep that it has uh, that it's needed um so to purchase that would it would need major renovations so you hope somebody comes in with some private money and can renovate that and do the same things that the other buildings downtown have have gone through so i think it depends on the on the piece of property the when i was a kid growing up in northern virginia in, in fairfax county Oh, what is now Old Town Alexandria was kind of a slum. There wasn't much there. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we know what it is now. It's this shining, super expensive place. And I'm not, I don't know where that money comes from and, and how it arrives. But when I look at the housing, I guess it's the old factory housing that's, that's in, uh, in Martinsburg, the, the townhouses the, sure. the, that's in there, there is so much development opportunity down there for whoever's got the courage and, you know, well, to, to put the money in. I think there's two types of investors out there. There's the investors that want to come in and they want to make things bright and beautiful and great and stuff like that. And then you have other investors that just want to come in. They want to purchase a piece of property as a write-off. And they don't really care what happens to it. They don't want to sink any money into it. They're, they're from out of state. Um, they're from Northern Virginia or wherever. They just needed a piece of property that they could write off. And we have a lot of out-state, out-of-state owners um, that, that are not from Martinsburg and, and really don't care about the piece of property. If it may have a, a, an apartment or two in it and it, you know, we'll, we'll rent them out. Whatever, the, whatever those are in. getting less and less, aren't they, Mike? I mean, well, right. And, uh, and uh, I think that's what you're seeing in Martinsburg, yeah. that more and more of the other type of investor. The are, Diego are Lasadas in. are coming in yes. and renovating building, buying the hubs, starting. I mean, the investment that he made in the garage, I don't know what it cost him, but it certainly couldn't have been cheap. Uh, he hoping, sees that vision. I'm hoping that and, and interwoven <clears> and... <throat> I'm hoping that's the spark that sort of ignites the the other kind of investment, you know, that, that makes it higher end residential yet still somehow affordable. I don't know what that. It, well, I think that's what people. that monument uh, is. I mean, affordable uh, right now. I think their their rents is fourteen to eighteen hundred. That's I would consider that affordable mm. the, in this day and age based on house prices and, and what rents are going for. So I know a lot of people say we need more affordable housing. You, Unless the government's going to come in and create affordable housing, you've got to let the market... Well, that's what they're decide. talking about. They're going to well, yeah. subsidized housing. Well, yeah, you, I mean, we have some of those in, in apartments, but... But if you're going to focus on 8A housing, then you're not going to have the the development that, that you want to have downtown. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, it, there's, there it has to be a balance. I think by law there has to be a balance. But you know, if if you want to attract the people who will attract more money to build the restaurants that then attract the more workers that will then look attractive for more companies to come in and bring their employees. And I got to tell you, not to not to be the negative person on all of this got to get the education system fixed you know you can't yeah that that's that should be at the top of the list to get the education system in berkeley county fixed and and statewide not just berkeley county but statewide it's (laughs) you don't want to even take me down this road (laughs) i mean it's the linchpin it is and and i think we I think it's a societal problem, John. That, that we've we've left it for too long. We, we've you can't just throw money at it. Even if we decided, hey, you know what? Let's pay every teacher seventy five thousand. Let's say we had that money. That's not going to change what's going on in our schools right now. It it, it might make it incentivize that people will take on that uh, thing, but it's. It's the whole system from top to bottom that we need to yeah, rework. It's, it's policy. I mean, it would yeah. help to have more teachers in, in the classrooms, absolutely. Yeah. But the policy from the top has to has to change and has to be enforced, um, especially discipline. Obviously, there's a huge discipline problem over at North. And, and I don't know what the policy is. And is it, is it, a, is it policies not being enforced or is 
does policy need to be changed? And, and that's what we, we probably have to take a deep dive into um, and, and try to fix that. And, and my guess is it's, it's not just North Middle. No. There are probably other schools that are, are, uh, need help as well. I think it's statewide. It's definitely statewide. West Virginia, 28% of West Virginia students, student, 28% of 8th graders in West Virginia are at grade for math. 43% are at grade for English. So it's, it, it's bad, but there's room for one county with enough focus to make it better. However, well, however to do that. And I know that there are constraints and this is, this is my frustration and y'all are in the legislature. So I'm talking to legislatures here, legislators here. There, there's a thousand reasons why things can't work. All it takes is for somebody to come up with a strategy to make it work. And I, I know there's a lot of Pollyanna and Mr. Smith in me here, but it's somebody's got to overcome it because for years and years and years, everybody's saying, well, we're trying, but we can't throw just, we can't just throw money at it. So it's a problem that's got to be fixed. And, and it's not just the board of education. It's not just the superintendent. It's not just the governor. It's not, I, I think it's probably a constitutional issue. Well, who controls that? That's you guys. And, um, well, and not the body politics. I mean, we, we can put something on, on, on the ballot, but the, the Constitution, we can't change. Well, you can yeah. put it on the ballot and then really market and, the heck and, out of and, it. And, 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 and we tried to do that. I think we need to put that amendment solely by itself on the ballot and yes. see how it I does. Agree. And yeah. have the governor back, back it, it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe convince... A, a certain senator by then to back it too because he, he sure did change the, the the way that was i thought that was the uh intent of the legislation um or that piece of legislation was to we need to have change and i think that's that was the first ballot i cast as a west virginian and yeah. that word salad of four amendments was just ridiculous the and I, I really think everybody misinterpreted the results of that of that ballot. The second uh, amendment two was not a rejection of of the, the the elimination of the car tax. That's not what it was. It was it's what you're talking about earlier about not trusting the government. Mm -hmm. That's what it was a, a rejection of. But anyway, not not to get into the weeds there. I just until we this becomes such a vibrant area, the second that you can convince. Uh, somebody from Fairfax and Loudoun and Montgomery County and all these places with these education systems that it's safe to bring their third grader here and and they'll have a really fine education they don't have to pay $20,000 a year to get. You know, I, I think the education here is good. I think sometimes it's the way we measure education. And I don't know every state measures the exact same way. And, and you know, are we being fair to ourselves the way we measure our education? Is that one of the reasons we're ending up 49th? In some of these other states, you know, if you're using, if you're using uh, your test scores from an ACT or SAT as, as the basis for your education, those scores are going to be, in my opinion, higher because these are college-bound Extre students. Extremely higher, yeah. Right. Yeah. These, are, these are just the college-bound students who are taking these tests. It's, it's not the whole school. It's not a random sampling of the school either. It's, it's those who have studied the hardest and, and want to get a good grade on that so that they can get into a good college. So if that's how you're being being evaluated, then obviously those scores are going to be higher. And I think it's unfortunate because the ACT and the SAT is focused on those college level folks, the, the, the types mm -hmm. of uh, testing that you have. Uh, I, I think sometimes we forget that there are lots of kids who don't go to college and that's a that's fine. They go through trades or they go through sure. uh, community college or they have something that they want to do and they don't necessarily. But that's across the board. That's that's true. I mean, take take Northern Virginia and New York and those places out of it. That's that's true in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and, and Arkansas and mm -hmm. Kansas and Tennessee. We're below all of those. I mean, it's, it, you know, so it's not, you, you can't blame the test that everybody, we're being judged on, on, on the same standards. Are we? Are we, though? Because are, if, if, those, if those individual states are just judging 
their scores on ACT, SA, ACT and SAT, but we're judging it not on in third else. grade. We're or, well, right. So we we have some of the best um, pre K testing, like uh, right up to third yeah, grade. Like yeah, we 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 are exceptional in the in in the early early. Thing. And then by the time we get into third grade, and we're, we've addressed that, we're bringing the aides in, we're doing this, I think you're going to see a marked improvement here over the next five, six years in, in those those scores in, in, in first, because second, and third. Because, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, you, if you can focus on math and reading at an early age, it will be trickle up um, test scores all the way through high school. And we're only in our second year of doing this, so. Oh, in any change, if we can fix everything today, we won't actually see the real changes for another seven or eight years because it's got to get all the way through. The sad part of this is we've sort of already lost the fifth graders on up. Yeah. You know, so that's a, it's, it's, it's a long slog. And this is the tragedy of, of the, the COVID overreach nonsense that, that we went through. And, and we've talked on here before many times. The test has to mean something. You know, when, when a kid sits down and takes a test, it has to mean something to them. And, and, and every West Virginia count. student takes the SAT test. It's not just the ones going to college. Well, every, and I don't, I don't think that's, the, sa- I don't think that's the, the same in most states. No? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't. I, shouldn't, I shouldn't go out on my skis yeah. on that. But... I, I think it's a mistake to hide behind the test scores. I, I think that people need to step up across the board and accept the, the embarrassment of what this is and to own it and say, all right, this, this is the day we accept, <laughs> we accept our sins for what they are, and now we move forward and find a way to fix it. And how do we force parents to do that? Well, that's that's a different thing. Well, that, um, that, that's a that's the third leg that's holding the well, stool and up. Well, and it's a big leg, and you do that. <laughs> I, and I don't know what when you get into um, economic prosperity. I'm going to guess, or lack thereof, is, is a big issue, a big contributor to the the drug problem. We heard on this show that in, I think it's Lewis County, where 44 percent of juveniles across the board, 44 percent, are in foster care. You know. I, that's, I, that's obviously a factor. There's no doubt about that. But you also have to look, and when we're looking at just the education system and whether or not they're putting out a good product, how many how many individuals that have gone through our public school system here in Berkeley County have gone on to an Ivy League school or to one of the military academies or just so or the, to WVU and become the, an engineer? The you know? edu- right. So the education is there. It's, it's being put out. I, I can't blame the school system for all of this. But no, but th- th- remember where this conversation started. It's not the absolute value of the school system. We're talking about how do we attract businesses and people into West Virginia. Sure. How do we overcome, you know, the, the joke Stigma. status? And well, at, I, I, at one, as you know, and I'm I'm a I'm a carpetbagger. You know, I just got here a couple yeah. of years ago. I want to close the door behind me. I really like it here. I moved here because of, of <laughs> now, now that you're here. But, but yeah, yeah. yeah. like to go to Wall too. But but I don't Before have little kids, here. right? So, but at the same time, you look at the statistics. The Eastern Panhandle doesn't have a problem attracting people. Well, clearly, it, no. we we have multiple people showing up, uh, and we can't keep up. So it, it, it's the It's not stopping them. We do have to take our final break. Uh, We're going to take a two-minute break, and we'll be right back. 